Welcome. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about chemistry. And so let's first start out with um, a little example of something you may have seen before. And that is these stars. Um, and perhaps you've seen these fluorescent stars if you go ahead and you take those and you put them under a bright light. And then you go ahead and take them into the darkness. They look a little bit like this. And they glow really, really brightly. And the question is, why do they do that? And it really has to do with the position of electrons on the atom. But before we can actually talk about that in, in um, particular, we need to kind of talk about the structure of an atom itself. And so we'll kind of start out by talking about these subatomic particles that comprise an actual atom. And so first we have protons, we have neutrons, and then we have electrons. And as you can see, the protons and neutrons are the two largest ones that comprise an actual atom. And they are each um, about the same mass, about one atomic mass unit. And you may be asking yourself, what is an atomic mass unit? Well, it's the weight of one mole of whatever you're measuring. And of course, what in the world is a mole? Well, a mole is actually 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. In essence, a whole lot of particles. Um, <clears throat> but in, in a, a relation, we can actually look in, at an electron and see that an electron is very, very small. It's actually so small that it's almost close to zero atomic mass units. It's really, really small in comparison. Um, another thing we can also look at comparing these three different types of subatomic particles is their charge. So first you can see that protons are positively charged, and then the electrons are negatively charged, so they kind of um, cancel each other out, if you will. They oppose each other. And the neutrons, like their name, are actually neutrally charged. They actually have no real charge at all. And if we look at kind of the arrangement of these subatomic particles actually within an atom itself, we can see that um, an example here is first and foremost, in the nucleus are the protons and neutrons all kind of collected together. And then we can kind of look at um, our understanding of where electrons are. Um, and our kind of current understanding is that they are kind of floating around it, if you will, um, in these energy shells that kind of surrounds the nucleus. Um, and in many cases, they actually kind of go together in pairs like we have in this description of helium that's shown here. And we can clearly see that we have two electrons two protons, and those of course offset each other, and then two neutrons. And if we remember that protons and neutrons each weigh one atomic, atomic mass unit, then we can actually say that with this particular um, uh, atom in helium, we have two protons, two neutrons, which are each two AMU, so the total kind of mass of this atom is about four AMU, okay? Because of course we know electrons, um, their mass is negligible, so it doesn't really contribute all that much to this particular atom. And so then what we can do is we can kind of move on and talk about a whole bunch of these different um, elements within the periodic table of elements. And hopefully if you've seen this before, and if you ever wanted to come up with one of these and find one on your own, you can always just Google it um, in Google Image and you can find all different types of periodic tables. But they all kind of have the same format. And for us in biology, we're really kind of interested in just the shoulders, the ones that are on the right and the left sides. All the stuff in the middle is, is while it's important, it's not as important for most of the biological uh, molecules that we've already actually talked a little bit about. So we're going to be focusing on the outsides. And just to kind of orient ourselves as to how a periodic table gives us the information we need, we're going to be focusing in on just one element to start out with. So that's carbon, and so I'm going to blow that one up so we can take a look at all the different pieces that are contained within that. And so here you can see it. And so, of course, um, most uh, periodic tables will list the actual name of the element at the top, so you always have that available. And then there's a whole bunch of information down below it. So that first number that you actually see is what's called the atomic number. And that actually indicates the number of protons that are given, um, that a given atom actually contains. And so for carbon, of course, we know that it has six protons, so its atomic number is six. Next, we have the atomic symbol, and this is a symbol that's given to each atom. In the case of carbon, it's C. In many cases, it's the first letter or first couple letters, but there are some variations because there's some redundancy, so be aware of that. And then the bottom number is what's called the atomic weight, which is the weight of the atom, kind of remembering back to the fact that neutrons weigh one AMU and electrons weigh nothing. So in this particular case, the atomic weight is 12.011. 
And so kind of as a refresher, the atomic number is the number of protons. And if we do some math and say the atomic weight is about 12, and we know that there's six protons, we can actually do the math and say, well, that probably means that there's six neutrons. And of course, if we know that there are six protons to offset those positively charged um, particles or subatomic particles, we know that there has to be six electrons. So we've been able to kind of figure out all the pieces of a carbon atom just by looking at a periodic table. And you can do that with any of them. And it's always good practice to kind of give that a try. So we can then kind of take a look at it, what this this uh, particular atom may actually look like in cartoon form. And you can hear, see here the nucleus with the neutrons and the protons and then the electrons floating around that. And it's important for us to kind of understand where the electrons go because there are these, as I mentioned, these energy shells. So the internal shell, the innermost shell, holds a max of a two electrons and that is as many as it can actually contain. It always has a max of two. And then the other electrons go outside of that but each shell outside of that internal one can hold a max of eight electrons, which is often referred to as this octet rule. And if you know some a little bit about chemistry, you know that there are some exceptions and some kind of squirrely things that go on there, but these are two good rules of thumb for us when we're talking about biological molecules and the atoms that are usually um, comprised within those is to kind of understand these general patterns. Um, in addition, we can also kind of see um, it represented in this form, which is called the Lewis dot structure. Um, and it's called that because, of course, the dots there are actually representative of those electrons in the outermost shell. And so you may have two shells, you may have three shells, maybe one shell, four shells, however many you want. But these um, Lewis structures always show the number of electrons in the outermost shell because those are the ones that are in most cases tend to be the most important. And we'll talk more about those in a little bit. So then let's go back to what we saw um, in the periodic table. <clears throat> the key thing is, is that we've kind of mentioned that we had these six protons, six electrons, six neutrons, but if we actually looked at that actual atomic weight, it was not exactly 12. It was 12.011. So the question is, why is it 12.011? Well, a lot of students guess that that extra little tiny bit of, of weight there, or mass, is because of electrons. And they say, well, maybe that's just the electrons weighing into it. But I will tell you that electrons, that is actually not the right answer, because electrons are significantly less mass than 0.011. And so they are not the electrons weighing into that. That's not the reason for that. But we can kind of fuss with some of the other components. So it's not the electrons. Well, what about the protons? We said the protons was actually what was this um, atomic number here. So if we change this number, say we change it to seven, that would actually change this entire atom. The element would not be carbon, but it would be, it would be nitrogen. So that's clearly not something we could actually fuss around with. That's not, that's not something that's, that makes something different. It would actually change the element itself. But we could change the number of neutrons, and that could actually change the mass. So instead of having six neutrons, you could have seven neutrons, and that would actually keep it a carbon because there would be six protons. And if we had, again, six electrons, that would keep the mass okay. And that would then be um, this example of a carbon-12 is a normal one we would have, but carbon-13 would be that example of something having an extra neutron. Okay, so it actually makes it a little bit heavier. So it's different than the normal carbon-12 that has six um, protons, six neutrons, and six electrons whereas carbon-13 actually has that extra neutron to make it a little bit heavier. And we can also see carbon-14 does a little bit of the same thing. It actually has two extra neutrons. And carbon-14 is indeed that um, carbon-14 that you're familiar with that they use for carbon dating to be able to actually date things. And so um, we are familiar with some of these, for these different forms. And we can actually see there's lots and lots of different forms of carbon. Um, they keep going, carbon-15, carbon-16, all the way up to carbon-22. And then we can actually also reduce or, or kind of lose number of neutrons to make it even lighter. So it can go from carbon 11 to carbon 10, all the way up to down to, to carbon eight. And so there's lots and lots of what we actually call isotopes of carbon. And these are just simply the same element, but they can contain different number of neutrons. So they change the mass, if you will. And so in essence, what happens is if you actually take one particular mole of carbon that's representative of all the different types of carbons um, in, our, in our environment, you're actually gonna find that it's not exactly 12 because there are these other isotopes. 
Clearly the most common is carbon-12, which is why it's very, very close to 12, but there are these other different forms or isotopes. And so we know that the atomic weight is reflective. It's actually an average of the kind of relative proportions of isotopes um, in the environment.